This morning, we're going to be continuing on through our study through the book of Galatians. Uh, we're going to be looking at Galatians 5, 16 through 26, living by the Spirit. And so this is one of the most uh, comprehensive lists of what it means to be a Christian, uh, the kind of attributes that we're supposed to have, what living in the Spirit is supposed to look like. And so I think this will be a wonderful study for us this morning. And so in Galatians chapter 5, just a little recap before we begin our, our, our study this morning. All right. uh, Paul was talking about the necessity of being justified in Christ and not being justified by the old law. One of the major things that he talks about as being a sign to these Christians in Galatia is that the reception of the Spirit. And he asked them, you know, you guys were going to the synagogues, you were listening to Jewish teachers for uh, years, if not decades, you never see the Spirit. I came into your town, I preached to you, you were baptized, you received the Spirit, you saw the miracles, why would you want to go back into Judaism? So then he talks about being justified by the Spirit, Galatians 5, 1-15, through 15, through Christ. And then he talks about what that looks like in verses 16-20. How can you tell if somebody is molding their life to the Spirit? How can you tell if someone is living differently? Well, it gives us these lists, these works of the flesh versus the fruits of the Spirit. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. And so our first passage we should read together is going to be verses 16 through 18 of our text. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And so in 15 through 18, we're told about this spirit versus the flesh, about this irreconcil irreconcilable war that is going on in between us or in us about the flesh and the spirit. Uh, many of you have heard the story about the, um, the Native American... Uh, proverb about the wolf. If you haven't heard that, you're about to hear it, okay? And so there's this idea about this young Native American talking to his grandfather. And his grandfather is telling him about the wolves that are inside of him. And so the young boy is really fascinated with the fact there are two wolves inside of him. And the grandfather says, yes, there's two wolves. Uh, one wolf is, is bad and one is good. Uh, they're both at war fighting over you. You know, one is, is, is negativity and strife and war and anger and, and resentment and all these negative things and the other wolf is, is good and kind and pleasing and loving and, and fruitful and, and the little boy says which one wins and if you know the story go ahead and finish it the one you feed right and so that's exactly what Paul is really saying here is which one is going to, which, which one are we going to choose basically which one are we going to feed which one are we going to allow to win in our lives is it going to be the desires of the flesh or is it going to be the desires of the spirit only one can win there can only be one victor. There can only be one person on the podium. And so, but we have the free will to ultimately choose which one it's going to be. Now, some people, some people who have an idea of Christianity would say that there, the Spirit is irresistible. That there is no such thing as free will. That if God has chosen you before the foundation of the world, if you've been predestined, and then you cannot deny the Spirit's impact in your life or the fact that you're saved. But that doesn't seem to be at all what Paul says throughout the entire book of Galatians, nor does it appear to be what he says we're here in this passage, the fact that we have a choice, that we get to choose which wolf's going to win, or the one we're going to choose, the one we're going to feed. And so it is a continual process that we've got to do. Uh, one does not overtake us without our consent and with our stamp of approval. Uh, the word here is peripateo. This is interesting because there's two different words used for walk in this section, almost as a bookend. And so if you see in our very first section that we're looking at, verses 16 through 18, you're going to look at the Greek word that's used, peripateo, where in the very last section that we're going to talk about today, a different Greek word is used. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it's interesting, the differences between the two, and I think it's interesting that Paul kind of uses this, this bookend, if you will. You know, on a bookshelf, you've got bookends, the front and the beginning, right? Uh, sometimes they'll put them there to let you know this is the end of a section. And here, between verses 16 and 26, Paul starts it off by using the word peripateo, and then he ends it by using stoikes. Uh, peripateo is a, a daily active lifestyle. I mean, this is, this is something that you do each and every day. This is your conduct. This is your character. This is your mode of thinking. This, this is who you are. You know, the, the choices that you make each and every day may seem insignificant, but ultimately they define the person that you are. That, that's peripateo. The 
the fact that you are a person of character and your character is based upon the decisions and the actions that you make. And so Paul says, be sure that you are choosing wisely. Be sure that you're walking in the way that pleases the Lord by choosing to adhere to the Spirit. Any questions or comments so far on flesh versus spirit? Anybody ever heard of like irresistible grace or irresistible uh, compelling of the Spirit? Anybody ever heard of that? Foreign to you? No? Uh, there's some, some Christian circles that teach that uh, when God wants you, that the Spirit comes into your life. He signs you. He gives you His seal of approval. And there's nothing that you can do to, um, to nullify God's grace or to reject the Spirit. And of course, in Galatians 5.4, it talks about falling from grace. And so, of course, we know that cannot be a biblical teaching. And so the next part, he goes in and talks about the works of the flesh. So, Isaac, if we know that there's the, the works of spirit, spirit and the works of flesh, uh, how do we know which one's which? Well, the Bible tells us, Old Testament, New Testament, about living a holy life, a life acceptable to God. And here Paul gives us a list in verses 19 through 21. So let's go ahead and read that list together. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgy, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so we've got to be sure that we don't fall ourselves into these things. I've got to pause just for a brief second. I had a really funny story that may have been slightly inappropriate, and I wanted to run it by my wife. <laughs> And uh, she said, don't do it. So, uh, it's, a, it's a good story. And you would love it and laugh. And I can edit it out of the video on YouTube. Still don't do it? Still do it? No. After the closing prayer, if you stick around, I'll tell it. Okay. Um, so, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Anyways. Uh, the first category, uh, it would go along with class. It would be, it would be pertinent to the whatever. Anyways, um, the first list that Paul gives us, he gives us four different categories of sins here. The first category of sins that he gives here is sexual sins. He talks about fornication, which is the widest and most broadest sense of the term usage here. And so he says that, that any type of, of fornication or any illegitimate sexual act, uh, whatever that might be, falls under sins of fornication, whether that is adultery or premarital sex or prostitution or incest or homosexuality. All those things fall under this heading. Um, the Gentiles, the pagans, uh, in their background, uh, sex was not seen as an overly negative thing. In fact, you had entire religious cults that were devoted to sex. And basically, uh, sex was a form of worship. You would actually go to temples, and there would be uh, priests and prophetesses that would have sex with people that would come to the temples. I mean, it was, it was, a, a, and I, it was one of the ways they worshipped. And here, uh, Christianity in the first century, uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't like when I talk to people about the Bible, and they're like, well, that was their culture. You know, you're trying to put, like, the, the, their culture on our culture. And culture has changed, so the Bible doesn't mean... And the, the Bible was countercultural in the first century. It's countercultural in the 21st century. But the idea that the Bible is null and void because, you know, it was a different culture back then compared to today is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, it's just, it's just dumb. Because the Bible did not fit into the confines of culture, Greek, Greek, Greco-Roman culture, in the first century. And so then he talks about uncleanness, which also has kind of a, a description of impure sexual motives. 2 Corinthians 12, 21, Ephesians 5, 3, or Colossians 3, 5. And then he talks about lasciviousness. Now, lasciviousness is just being overly sexual. It's just uh, whether it's immodesty or whether it's just indecency or crude language about sexual things. Uh, lasciviousness is just being 
uh, indecent, if you will, whether it's by the way you dress, by the way you talk, or by the things that you do or allude to. And so as Christians, uh, our bodies are the temples of God. Uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that, that our bodies are a living temple, uh, purchased with the precious blood of God, and that we should glorify God with our bodies. And that includes with our sex. You know, our sex should be between a man and a woman in the confines of marriage. Uh, that glorifies God. Any other way that that does take place does not glorify God. And we have to make a choice. We have to make a decision if we're going to glorify God with our bodies or if we're going to bring shame upon our bodies and shame upon the church. And so that's the first thing that Paul talks about here in this section. The second uh, category that he talks about is religious. Idolatry was a major thing in the Old Testament. In fact, God says that that is the reason why He allows the Babylonians to come in and to destroy them and to destroy the temple and take them off into captivity is the fact that they worshipped idols. Isaiah 44 verses 9 through 20 describes the foolishness of idols. You know, how, how dumb it is to worship uh, things made by the hands of man. How, how ridiculous it is to worship stone and wood and carvings and, and precious metals. Isaiah, and Isaiah 44 9 through 20 when he just goes on and on about just how ludicrous it is uh, to worship something that's just so uh, basic. And then we can see, um, but we still have a problem with that today. Uh, men can clearly see there is a power in the universe, Romans 1.20. And people have an innate desire to seek out God, Acts 27.27. That's 27. Uh, one of the reasons why if you go into any and every major um, culture in the history of the world, they're not atheists. There's always some deity. There's always some being. There's always some... Man has this innate desire to fulfill his life with something greater than himself. And so, that should be God. And for much of the ancient world, after the Tower of Babel, and uh, they just went off into sin, Romans 1 tells us, they worshipped idols. Uh, but we are no different today. Uh, sometimes we look at the people in the Old Testament and think about how, how, how dumb could you be to worship idols. But we still worship idols today. Um, whether it's money or whether it's athletics, uh, whatever it is. I mean, I, I know some people who are raised in a church that won't step foot in a church, but will drive four hours to Knoxville to watch UT play every Saturday. You know what that's called? Idolatry. You know, you've got some people that, you know, won't come to Sunday night services, but they'll take their kids to a travel ball tournament in Florida. You know what that's called? Idolatry. It's, it's the same thing. We've just replaced one thing with the other. And is it bad to watch UT play on Saturday? Well, if they're good, no. You know, <laughs> if they're bad, you just wasted four hours. Um, you know, is it bad to take your kids to a, to a travel tournament in Florida? No. But when those become the sustenance of our life, when it becomes our driving force, we've missed a point. And we've become people who worship idols, just like people in the Old Testament. Ours aren't made out of stone in a temple. It's just, a, it's just you know, whatever it is that, that takes the place of number one on totem pole. The second uh, thing that he talks about here is sorcery. And the word he uses there is pharmakia. Anybody know a word that is, that is influenced by that Greek word, pharmakia? Pharmacy, right? Pharmacology. And so, um, in the ancient world, this, world, this word was used in a multiple ways. Uh, people that would try to use potions or incantations, people that would try to cast spells. Um, it was more of a negative way than what we think of pharmacy. Um, but the idea that people would use spells or try to use different um, ingredients to do certain things was sorcery. And of course, in the Old Testament, uh, is strictly against the use of sorcery, as is the New Testament. And, um, but this does not mean like, like medicines. This has got a much more sinister um, point to it, whether it be magic or po potions or, or poisons. And so uh, the third thing, the third list or group is interpersonal sins. Uh, sins that we have against each other, whether that is enmity, uh, which means hatred or mean-spirited. As Christians, we shouldn't be mean or, or mean-spirited. We shouldn't look like we've got, you know, just sucked on a lemon. Uh, strife, uh, that's discord, uh, quarreling, uh, should not be in the church. John 17, 20 through 23 tells us that we should be unified and that we should be one. Have you ever met somebody that just like wanted to have a church split? Like, they just like, just, just like wanted to have like this, I don't know, like, they like craved like just arguments and had to have a rival and just, just not very pleasant to be around. 
know what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, 11 and 3, 3? To put them out of the congregation. The Bible says if somebody's going to have that type of attitude where they're looking to, be, to break down the congregation instead of building it up, Paul says just get rid of them. Don't eat them. Because they're only there to cause problems. We've got to be Christians. We've got to seek to build the church up together and to be friends and companions and encouragers and not be people who are going to have strife. Uh, jealousy is an intense negative feeling over someone else's accomplishments or selfish fleshly desires. Uh, if somebody else is, is better at something than you are, congratulate them. Encourage them. Ask them how they do it. Uh, jealousy is ugly on any person. Right? We shouldn't be people of, of, of jealousy. Fits of anger. Um, this was big for me. I don't know if you know this or not. You probably can't tell from my disposition, but I used to have an anger problem. Um, like when I was in high school, they wanted to send me to anger management. Um, but I just, I was just immature. I mean, I just, just could not... And I could. I decided I did not want to put in the effort to restraining my emotions. And, uh, and we've all been there. But if you have fits of rage, uh, grow up. You know, two-year-olds have fits of rage, right? I mean, it's, it, adults don't. We, we take a step back, take a deep breath. You think about things. You try to rationalize what's going on in the situation. Sometimes you just got to just walk away. There's all types of things we can do. But as Christians, if we have fits of anger, it just shows a lack of self-control on our part. Uh, rivalries, uh, selfish ambition, Philippians 1.17. Count others higher than yourselves. James 3.14 and 16 says that we should be looking to build each other up. Dissensions. It's only mentioned here and in Romans 16, 17. And it refers to a warning to cause division. Romans 16, 17 says, once again, those should be avoided at all costs. And if people just persist in wanting to divide the congregation, <coughs> that they have to be put out of the congregation. Uh, divisions or factions. Uh, those who promote denominationalism are exactly what this verse is referring to. Uh, people that think it's good for the body of Christ to be divided and that there should be just, you know, just this, 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 this separatism of everybody and everything um, is called against as a work of the flesh. And then, of course, envy is the desire that causes to do hurtful and damaging actions towards others. Uh, this word is used of the Jews in Matthew 27, verse 17, when they envied the popularity of Jesus. But also, Paul uses that to describe false teachers in Philippians 1, 15 through 17, about individuals who preach the gospel out of envy, uh, just basically for, for money and cause the church harm. The last kind of group that he uses here is riotous living. And that the two he uses here is drunkenness and orgies. Drunkenness only appears here and in Luke 21.34 and Romans 13.13. 13. Orgies appears here and in Romans 13.13 13 and in 1 Peter 4.3 with two other lists that we have about inappropriate conduct for Christians. And all these sins, either one of these four things, whether we're talking about the sexual sins, whether we're talking about um, the uh, religious uh, sins, the, the interpersonal sins, the righteous sins, all these things take place in the same origin. And that is the heart. And this is not an exhaustive list because in our text, Paul here says, and things like this. And so this is an exhaustive list, but Paul was saying uh, these are kind of the four categories and some of the bigger ones. But there's all kinds of things. Anything that con uh, contrasts the Word of God is going to be in this group. The gospel has never meant yielding to sin. In our culture, in our society, and even the church today, uh, we don't preach on sin like we used to. Um, and I'm a preacher. Um, we don't denounce sin like we used to. Um, maybe it's because we're soft. Maybe we're concerned about people's feelings. Uh, maybe we're concerned about living in glass houses. You know, whatever it is, uh, we don't preach about those things. But the Bible, the gospel has never meant to take an easy path uh, or, or bat an eye against sin. I mean, that's not what we're supposed to do as Christians. And so Paul tells them that they've been instructed to live a holy life, and they've got to start doing that. They've got to put away the sins of the flesh. These false teachers, these Judaizers, wanted to enslave them with the yoke of the Old Testament. But Paul here says that that is inappropriate, and neither is the yoke of, of sin. And so we've got to be sure that we aren't uh, teach, Christians who teach today that, that sin is okay. Um, there's a growing call in the church to um, accept homosexuality. Um, it's a sin. I mean, I even read articles written by people in the church that try to say that homosexuality is not a sin. When Paul was writing uh, 1 Corinthians 6-9, he was talking about people who were in a monogamous, I mean, a, yeah, a monogamous relationship between 
two same-sex individuals, but these individuals are being unfaithful and cheating on their same-sex partners with other same-sex individuals. And so Paul wasn't really condemning homosexuality. He was condemning unfaithfulness. Like that's just all kinds of articles that you can read. Preachers preach that from a pulpit. It's just it's ludicrous, right? I mean, it's just it's it's insane. It's asinine. It's just it's just wild. But what about adultery? Like like think about it this way. If a couple walked into the congregation and they sat there and they were a same-sex couple who had a legalized marriage in the state of South Carolina and they came in, we would be loving, we'd be kind. But we would also gently show them that they're living in an inappropriate relationship, right? Because they're in a sinful relationship. As Christians, do we not have that call? To deny sin, first and foremost, in our own lives, but also in the lives of others? Is this thing on? Hey! <laughs> yes or no, right? Does it get harder with time? Does it get harder because culture decides to accept it? Right? Here's interesting. We do that with some sins, not others. Because if you take a, a couple that comes in who's got a marriage that's recognized by the state, South Carolina or Tennessee, but they're living in an adulterous marriage, then what do, what do we say? It's wrong. Well, we tell the homosexual couple it's wrong, but the heterosexual couple that walks in an adulterous relationship, which is in the same list, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Many congregations of the Lord's Church today don't say anything. Why? Because they've lost the battle. Paul says there's a battle going on in our bodies right now between sin and righteousness. And they've lost the battle. They're in the process of losing the war, but they've lost that battle. And if you lose that battle, eventually you lose the battle of homosexuality or, or any other sin there is. Because we've got to stand firm. There's a war going on. It's, it's that serious. Is that, is that a big thing to have to do? Absolutely. But, I mean, someone's eternal soul was a serious thing. And so we can't take a back seat and say, well, the works of the flesh, sins, ah, we're all sinners. Well, have you ever sinned in your life? I know I have. Right? Still do. But we've got to be in a warfare. We've got to be fighting. We've got to be striving to do the right thing, even when we mess up. And so, so many people have just thrown in the towel with the works of the flesh. But well, nobody's perfect, so why even try? Once you have that type of attitude, you're defeated. Because Paul says is you've got to fight. You've got to wage war. And so then he talks about the fruits of the Spirit in verses 22 through 24. We'll go ahead and read that passage together. 22 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with His passions and His desires. In Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45, and Mark 3, uh, 7 through 8, Jesus talks about the God-given qualities that people are going to have, those who obey the gospel, that we've got to change, that people will be able to tell who we are by our fruits. And here Paul extends on what Jesus says there in those passages and talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, the true believer will find himself growing in these areas of his life more and more. And it takes time. Um, I'm more patient today than I was at 15. I hope I'm more patient at 55 than I am at 26. I mean, it's a process. We understand that. But we've got to be growing in these things. Love is the first thing mentioned on the list. And I don't think that's a... Uh, uh, I think that's intentional. Uh, love is, is so important in the Bible. The Bible is a love story about God sending Christ to redeem us from our sins. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. The greatest gift that we have from God is what? Right? Faith, hope, and love abide. The greatest of these is love. And so is love important to have as Christians? Absolutely. Jesus says that that is going to be the trait how others can tell that we are His disciples. That if we have love one for another. And so is it important for us to have love in this congregation for each other? Absolutely. I mean, we've got, if we lose the love that we have in the congregation, first of all, for the Lord, for His Word, but for each other, uh, the, the Lord's church is not going to grow like it should, whether we're talking about spiritually or numerically or in our faith. 
And so we've got to be sure that we're loving towards each other. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, when you love someone, you realize they're not perfect. Um, that doesn't mean that we accept sin. That doesn't mean that we bat an eye towards sin. But it doesn't mean that we love them and want the best for them and realize that sometimes they're going to mess up just like we messed up. We're, we don't want to put them down or, or hold them to some stringent levels of, of criticism, but we want to build them up. Um, John 14, 15, of course, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we love God, we're going to strive to obey Him. Uh, the second thing that we're told in this list to have is joy. How, how is joy different from being, like, happy? Yeah. Miss Lisa said it's like, a, it's like an inner feeling that you have. Uh, someone else? Contentment. contentment. I think there's a lot of a, a hope, a contentment. Um, someone else? Something they want to shade in our definition with? Joy is independent of outside influences. Happiness is dependent upon outside influences. Does that make sense? You're happy because of something going on in your life. Uh, you're happy because uh, your kid hit a home run. Or you're happy because you got a bonus this year. Or you're happy because you got to get off a little early from work. Or whatever it is. Joy is the emotion that you have or that you're supposed to have that is independent from outside influences. Your boss is a jerk. But you still got an inner peace and joy inside of you. Uh, you don't know how you're going to pay the bills this month. But you still have a joy and contentment that Christ has given you through His Word and through salvation. Uh, you have quarrels with your family and they don't like X, Y, or Z, but yet you still have a joy that lets you know that no matter what happens in this life, God's got your back for eternity. Yes? Yeah. And uh, joy is the deep the deep seated confidence that God is in control of my life. Yeah, and I agree. I agree. And that's, that's the kind of thing that, that no matter what happens to me, God's in control. And He's promised me in Romans 8, 28 that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. And I believe that. And so no matter what happens in my life, I believe that. And so I've got that joy, that, that inner peace and contentment that I have. Yeah. That's right. And so we, we've got to have that joy. You ever met a Christian who's lost their joy? Yeah. Ever been a Christian who's lost their joy? I have. Um, sometimes it's hard. But we've got to be individuals. We keep our joy, right? And it's independent. When we put that joy on the shoulders of other individuals, they're going to let us down. When we put that joy on the shoulders of ourselves, We'll let ourselves down. But if we put that joy on the shoulders of God, He'll never let us down. And so that's what we've got to do. And the third thing that He says that we've got to have here is peace. Uh, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9.6. Uh, John 14.27, Jesus gives peace to His followers, but He will not give peace to those who reject Him, Matthew 10.34-36. And so we've got to have peace in our lives. We've got to be peacemakers. And the Beatitudes, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the sons of God. And so we've got to be sure that we are individuals who don't have fits of anger or rage, but that we have peace with everyone. Um, we don't go out looking for quarrels or for um, rivalries, but we generally seek to be peaceable with all individuals. Uh, the next thing he says we've got to have is patience. Uh, slow to anger and long-suffering. Uh, our patience is motivated by our love, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. How can you have patience? Because I love God. And you may say, well, Isaac, I don't, I, you know, I fail to see where there's a coordination between patience and loving God. Well, 1 Corinthians 13 says that the traits of love, which we get from God, who is love, one of those is patience. If I realize that God is in control, and if I realize that one day the Lord is going to come back, and that all rights, all wrongs will be righted, I can be patient, right? And uh, I still struggle with this one sometimes. Um, Oh, man. Yeah. Amen to that. Miss Lisa said, when you remember how patient God has been with us, it's hard not to be patient with others. Uh, 
That's that's deep. I mean, that's that's true. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Brother Austin said that patience is a sign of maturing. Uh, if you want to look at somebody who's immature, it's probably somebody who's impatient. Uh, sometimes we just have to wait our turn, right? Um, Brittany and I had this thing where, like, if we order something online and it's going to be like three to five days, it's going to be seven. Um, if we order something, it'll be here in three to six weeks, it'll be eight. Ever since we got married, it's always been like that. I've got no idea why, but it's just, you know, we bought chairs uh, for the table. They send the first box after like a week after supposed to be there. The chair was broken. So they were super nice. We sent it back and sent another one. It was broken. <laughs> super nice. We sent it back, sent another one. It was fine. And so uh, she had something wrong with her car. We took it to a mechanic. It was going to be fixed in three days. Uh, it was fixed 34 days later. Um, yeah, had one car family, which, you know, was a minor setback. But at the same time, you know, three, three to five days and getting the car back 34 days later was... I don't know. It's just something we, okay, I think the Lord's trying to help me with my patience, okay? He's, he keeps giving me these, these tests. It comes with age. It comes with age? Yeah. Well, if it gets worse as I get older, I don't know if I'll be able to stand it. Um, but, but, you know, we've all got our struggles, and I guess he's just trying to make sure that I'm patient. Um, but, but, you know, uh, one thing that we're supposed to expect is Christ's return. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 1, 2 through 3. And the rest of, the rest of life is just, uh, just you know, in His, in his time. Uh, the fifth thing that we're supposed to have is kindness. Uh, kindness is a word that means uprightness, goodness, and generosity. It's used eight times in the Bible. Four times it's used for God's actions towards us. Four times it's used for the actions Christians ought to have to others. I think it kind of corresponds to what Lisa said about the patience. Is that when we remember how kind and, and loving God has been towards us, how good He's been to us, then we should have the motivation to be good to others. I think it's ironic uh, that it's used eight times, four times for God, and four times for how Christians ought to act like towards others. And so we've got to be people who are kind to others, uh, who are gentle, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Colossians 3, 12. As Christians, we should have a genuine goodness in our hearts, a kindness uh, to help other people. Uh, the next thing on our list is goodness. And this is a little bit different. Now, you may say, Isaac, you just said that kindness means goodness. Well, it kind of does. But these are two separate Greek words. This Greek word is only used four times in the New Testament. And what this has to do, this has to do with um, action. Uh, the kindness here is more of a disposition. <clears throat> It's more of kind of like you smile, you're kind, you're meek, you're good to other people. This next verse is an action. Uh, being good through your actions. Whether it's giving of yourself, giving of your money, giving of your time. Being good to people. Uh, going out of your way to help them that doesn't benefit you in any type of way. That's, that's a trait as Christians we're supposed to have. The next one is faithfulness. Uh, faith, believe, and trust. Uh, we imitate God and the faith that He's put in us by putting our faith into Him. Uh, the next thing that we're told to have is gentleness, which is humility and meekness. And we talked about this a little bit uh, a few weeks ago, but uh, meekness is is not weakness. Um, meekness is strength harnessed under control. Um, Jesus was meek because as He rode into Jerusalem, He could have rode in on the chariots of angels. He went in on a donkey. Right? That's strength under self-control. When Jesus was on the cross dying for our sins, He could have called 10,000 angels, but He didn't. Not that He was weak, but He was meek. Was strength under control. Right? I think that we should all be strong, people of strength. If you're not strong as a Christian, you ain't going to make it. I mean, we've got to be strong, but we've also got to be gentle. We've got to have that strength harnessed under self-control. And then the next one, of course, is self-control. Used in many ways throughout the New Testament to refer anything from um, abstaining from sin to abstaining from sexual desires, uh, whatever the case may be. But it says here that those who have crucified the flesh are striving these things. Paul said earlier in this book, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Well, Paul, how are you doing that? Have you crucified the flesh? Well, he tells us the next chapter, Galatians 3.27, he crucified the flesh in baptism. But when he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, what do you mean by that, Paul? He gives us the list. He says, I'm trying to add these attributes to my life. 
And if we as Christians will do the same thing, then we can say, just like Paul in Galatians 2.20, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Because the attributes that He had when He walked the earth, I have in my life. And I'm showing Christ to other individuals because I'm adding these nine things to my daily walk uh, spiritually. Uh, comments that you have on these nine things about living uh, the fruits of the Spirit. I think they're all tied together, really. I don't think one can say I'm going to take half of these. Right. You can't live with half of them and leave the others out. They're all connected. And when one suffers, I think that they all are diminished in some form or another. And so, absolutely. I mean, we can't look at the list and say, there's nine, I got seven. It's like 80%. That's a B. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll pass. We should be striving in all areas of our life. And, and many of us struggle with at least one of these, if not more. And that's because we're human. That's okay. But we've got to be striving to try and grow each and every day in these nine things. And they're all connected, like you were saying. Any other comments or questions? No. Okay, so keeping in step with the Spirit, verses 25 through 26. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. <clears throat> Keeping in step. I mentioned before how this passage is kind of bookend with two words that mean to walk. The first which means to walk in your daily life. Then Paul goes on and talks about how um, we're either walk, we're working the works of the flesh or we're producing the fruits of the Spirit by our daily actions, our walk. It's more of an individual thing, right? This here, stoikos, stoikos, means to walk in step with like a soldier in a row or a formation. And so when we decide to not do these things, we have decided to let down our unit, if you will. Uh, if you've got a group of 50 soldiers walking in formation and you've got one guy that's out of step, you can see it. You can hear it. Your eyes immediately drawn to it because it's out of the ordinary. Maybe you've seen those things on Facebook where it's like, you know, can you find what's wrong in this picture? And it's like a bunch of peas and one peas backwards. You know, and a lot of times if you notice, your eyes almost immediately drawn to it because it's, it's just out of the ordinary. That's the same thing with a Christian. If we decide that we're not going to have these attributes in our life, well, we don't fit in. We're not fitting in with the Spirit. We're not walking in step with Christ. But we're also not walking in step with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not helping prepare them. And so Paul is admonishing and encouraging these Christians in Galatia, just like he's admonishing and encouraging us today, that, that this, is, this is a lifestyle. I mean, we're walking in formation. But if we choose to just ignore the call that we have to produce the fruits of the Spirit, then it's going to be of no benefit to us, and it's not going to help those we've surrounded ourselves in the battle uh, of living a Christian life. Uh, questions or comments on verses 25 through 26? No? You're always trying to be quiet, so I'll tell that story, aren't you? <laughs> so we'll have time at the end. Um... The conclusion that I, I think, the four things we can take away this morning from our text. We're in the midst of a war between the spirit and the flesh. And I'm afraid sometimes our view of the Christian life is too elementary. Um, sometimes I think the danger, uh, the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour from uh, Peter. I, sometimes I'm afraid people don't think enough of that. Uh, they think, well, if I'm, I'm, if I'm a decent person and I go to church every once in a while, I'll be okay. I know that's not you, but I'm just saying that so many people do not understand the fact this is a war. I mean, this is your eternal soul we're talking about. This is, this is heaven or hell. I mean, this is, this is big stuff. And yet so many people just take it kind of like, whatever, you know. And so as a Christian, just like the, the sermon this morning, don't become numb. I always realize that we're, we're in a fight. I mean, and the fight is over your eternal soul. Which one are you going to listen to? If we give in to the desires of the flesh, then we will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so we've got to be sure that we know what those things are and that we're not going to submit ourselves to those. Third thing is living as a Christian means that we must be bearing fruits of the Spirit. If you're not bearing those fruits in your life, um, then you're not living to your potential as a Christian. 
If you know you have fits of rage, if you know that you have impatience, if you know that you're not a very nice person to be around, um, then change. You know, anybody ever seen Rocky Four? Anybody? So he, I mean, he ended the Cold War, people. I mean, seriously. It's a joke. Like Rocky, he fights. If you don't know, okay. Rocky fights Ivan Drago. Ivan Drago kills his friend Apollo Creed, who was formerly an enemy of Rocky, but they become friends over Mr. T and Rocky Three. And um, anyways, we're talking, oh, okay, all right. The Soviets hate Rocky because it's the, it's the height of the Cold War, it's 1989. And so, you know, they, 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 they hate him. The Americans hate the Russians, the Russians hate the Americans. Rocky decides he's going to go fight Ivan Drago in Russia on Christmas Day, December 25th. The Americans are upset, but he goes and he fights Drago in this massive arena filled with these Russian soldiers and these people that hate capitalism and hate America, and they've got, like, the Russian oligarchs that are watching and you know, like Ivan Drago's is a physical specimen. Rocky fights for 15 rounds. About round 15 or 14, the Russian crowd does something crazy. Anybody know what they do? What they do? They start chanting Rocky in Russia. I mean, you guys seem unimpressed with this. <laughs> Maybe you haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah, you should go watch a movie. It'll make you want to fight somebody. Which, honestly, may not be the best thing. Anyways, they start chanting. And then Rocky wins the fight. He drops himself in the American flag. And he gives a speech. And he says, you know, I've realized something. Which is interesting because earlier in the movie, he's talking to Adrian. And she doesn't want him to fight because Drago just killed Apollo. And she's like, you can't win. He's like, I'm a fighter. You can't change me. Nobody can change. We are who we are. Uh, Kevin must be ready for the sort of the end. Anyways, all right. And so at the end of the movie, he drapes himself the American flag, and he says, everybody can change. As Christians, we're living that lifestyle. There are so many people who believe, I can't change. Even people who've been immersed in Christ have this idea in the back of their head, I can't change. Well, they've got to be like Rocky, who just defeated Ivan Drago, and say, everybody can change. And so we've got to realize the fact that, that Christ loves us and He's called us to change. That's what repentance is. It's a change. And so if we are not changing, then we're not living the life that Christ has called us to live. And when we walk according to the Spirit, we bring glory to God and we can rule over sin. Now, the Bible tells us that if we will submit ourselves to God, the devil will flee from us. The longer that you walk in the Spirit, the stronger you are in these aspects of your life, the easier it is to say no to sin. And so that's what we've got to do. If you're having a hard time saying no to sin, if you're struggling with sin, look at those characteristics of the Spirit. Do you have them in your life? <clears throat> that maybe was hindering you and trying to say no to those temptations or those sins is that you have not been saying yes to God. And if you say yes to God and grow in the Spirit, you'll be able to say no to sin. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments about Rocky or about Galatians 5, 16 through 26? That's right. You got to have that motivation. That's exactly right. Anyone else? No. Wonderful. I appreciate your attendance, your comments, and you listening to that kind of weird thing at the end with Rocky. So, uh, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and close the prayer. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings you've given us. We're so thankful for your word and for the power it has in our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to live by the Spirit, uh, to be able to be strong, either in private or public, to say no to sin, uh, to be able to look at our lives critically but lovingly and ask ourselves, how are we doing walking with the Spirit? Are these characteristics evident in my life? Can other people see them in the way that I live, in the way that I talk, in the way that I act? Please help us as a congregation and as individuals uh, to be the brightest lights in this community, to show individuals that we are the most patient, the most loving, the most kind, and that we derive all those things not from ourselves but from you. And help us to use it as a mission point uh, to bring other people into your fold and to have them also realize the power that we can have changing to live more and more like your son. We're so thankful for a sacrifice uh, for our lives, and we pray that uh, everything that we do brings glory and honor to Him. In His name we pray. Amen.